Welcome to The Trenches. I'm your host, Rob McCallum. With me today is a filmmaker who's got an incredible laundry list of credits. You will recognize his work on shows like Metalocalypse, Venture Brothers, Space Coast, Coast to Coast, uh, the upcoming animated series of Grimm's Fairy Tales, and he's even getting a documentary on the go on the Superman projects that was shelved by Warner Brothers that was supposed to be directed by Tim Burton. With me on the line is Mr. John Schnepp. John, are you there? Hey, what's going on, man? Not much. I really appreciate you taking the time out of this. I mean, you got a lot going on, uh, not with just some of those, uh, uh, you know, credits I listed, but you know, all these other projects that you're doing on the side as well. Uh, so, you should also let people know that if they want a little bit more background information on you, they can visit your website, which is johnschnepp.com, J-O-N-S-C-H-N-E-P-P.com. But you know, let's uh, quickly get a little bit of history so we can inform some of our listeners. You know, you work a lot in animation. So how did you get your start doing, uh, you know, in this crazy industry? Well, it was, uh, I was out of college for a couple of years and I was like kind of hanging out doing like some crazy uh, theatrical performing in front of bands. And uh, some friends of mine from college were uh, started up a music video company and they, they had uh, done Nine Inch Nails first music video, which was like shot at my house. Very cool. And uh, that got, you know, a lot of, a lot of, that became a very popular music video they did ministries first couple of music videos they're called h gun okay and there was in chicago and i i just started working there at night like hey can i use your computers and uh and you know type some stuff out and then i became like a a pa because they were like hey you, you know you know how to do like crazy animation and like you took that in because i went to the school of the art institute of chicago okay so i did a lot of experimental animation and experimental filmmaking and performance art and video and crazy stuff so uh, I just started uh, working at this uh, music video company, and they started hiring me to act in these music videos. So I'm in a bunch of uh, music videos in the '90s. Like I'm, I'm uh, Ozzy Osbourne's uh, lab assistant. I play this mad scientist in one of these music videos called, for Infectious Grooves. This band called Infectious Grooves. And, um, and you're also in a Metallica music video, are you not? Yes. Yeah. Really quick one. I- one of the four uh, coffin holders in that scene with Marianne Faithful. Right. But. Uh, yeah, there's a bunch of. I'm in the, an Iron Maiden, Be Quick or Be Dead. I'm fo- I'm featured in that video quite a bit. So it was kind of fun to do a bunch of music videos. And um, I was uh, hanging out there. I just started to learn how to edit and learned how to do After Effects and, and animation. I had done it in college, but I was sort of like, this is really fun. And I couldn't believe I, I could get paid to do this stuff. And uh, so I wrote this weird science fiction comedy uh, show with a friend of mine, Dave Murray. And uh, we made it in the back of this uh, music video production uh, the loft. We built all these sets. We raised money from family and friends. Uh, the original Kickstarter way to do things, which is just like <laughs> yeah. ask your uncle, ask all your best <laughs> friends. Like, luckily, we had a, a well-off friend who was like, uh, like wanted to take off and go to India, and he was like, "Here, I'm going to just buy an Avid and buy this SGI machine. You guys can use it while I'm gone." So that's how I learned how to edit. Was a friend of mine, Ivan, had bought this Avid, and uh, it was like in 1993, so it was like the th- the 83rd Avid or something. And so I just was like, "Wow, this is an incredible machine, nonlinear digital editing. Here we go!" So uh, we made this this crazy science fiction comedy series. Uh, we've never released it. I think we're going to release it this year. It is awesome. the 20th anniversary. It stars Dave Keckner, Rich Fulcher, Matt Besser, Ian Wa- Ian Roberts. I'd like it's a literal who's who of uh, of of uh, Chicago comedians from the time. Then they all launched off to do their own stuff, obviously, but uh, with super success. So I'm excited just for people to check this weird oddity out. So uh, I'm sure I'll just start dropping it on, on the internet at some point later this year. But so that spawned into, uh, do starting to do a lot of commercial jobs once I learned how to do all this stuff. I mean, ultimately that pilot never sold, but MTV saw it and they hired me to, uh, be the art director, animation director, and editor of their first interactive movie game, which was a giant failure. But it was like, hey, it was a, it was a great job. They ended up using a, an engine from like the early 90s. So the game itself, when it came out in 1996, with, was like seven frames a second, <laughs> like a postage stamp-sized video screen. And all of their competitor games were like full screen video with 30 frames per second, awesome CG animation. And so all the work that we did, you couldn't even see it. So right. it was one of those horrible things where it's like, yeah, this is going to be really cool. And then when it comes out, you can't even play it. You're like, it keeps 
uh, crashing on me, and I can't. I don't know what I'm doing. It was one of those, <laughs> one of those nightmares. But uh, I'm still proud of all the work that all everybody who worked on that did. That's where I met Nick Offerman. I met a whole bunch of actors working on that on that weird uh, um, science fiction mystery interactive CD-ROM game. CD-ROM takes you back. So uh, <laughs> from that, uh, my friend Greg, who directed that, suggested I go out to Atlanta. He's like, because uh, 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 Mike Lazo, the head of Adult Swim, now King Lazo, back then he was still King Lazo, but he was like a lot younger. And uh, he was like, I'm looking for some weird editors. So uh, my friend Greg was like, I know a weird editor. <laughs> so... so uh, I sent off my reel, and they they hired me to go out to Atlanta, like in ninety, I think this was in ninety five, to do Space Ghost Coast to Coast. Cool. Maybe it was ninety four. I can't remember now. But um, yeah, that was fun. I was out there for like three months, and it was before Cartoon Network was even like an official like right uh, thing. I mean, the, the Adult Swim obviously didn't exist, but it was like everyone was in this giant like airport hangar. It's just like TBS, CNN. You know, everybody was all in like in these like cubicles it was pretty weird and i was placed really far away from everyone else at cartoon network because they didn't have space for me so i was like sandwiched in like seven lawyers like <laughs> cubicles and they locked my computer to the desk i freaked out and fucking told told them to take the chains off it was it was a lot of fun working there uh because i used to have long hair and wear biker boots and then you know there's all these nerds with suits suits and ties like i don't know he seems dangerous you know <laughs> i think he's gonna steal the computer you know it was like, you fucking idiots. I'm here to work, you fucking pieces of shit. <laughs> so it was like so amazing. Like how, you know, and you know, it's it's great to get judged by the look, you know. Yeah. The old, the old book by the cover thing. It really it really is a true thing. People well, are like, he looks dangerous. It's like <sighs> all right, just take the chains off. I'm not taking the computer. What am I gonna steal it and then still work here? What are you guys stupid? You know? Yeah, and you know anyway. that, that's that's kind of an interesting. You you bring up the book by the cover because that's a theme that kind of goes through some of the some, from some of your credits and stuff like that. I mean, you look at like uh, the the Death Clock guys, uh -huh. and, and you get this you know like biker kind of image, but then they all have these unique characters under there. Same with some Venture Brothers stuff, and of course, uh, uh, even the Superman doc that that you're interested in doing. It's like the weirdest Superman on the surface, right? But, but underneath it, it's you know something so much more interesting and, and creative. So it's interesting yeah. that you, that you know you were this kind of fish out of water in this corporate you know white color. Well, I know, thing, right? And now you're you've turned that around and that experience in some way, and you've you know fed it back into your shows and stuff. Uh, just uh, just on the on your rise to kind of what you're doing now, what would you say was the hardest part about starting it? At, uh, everything because it sounds like a lot of it was you were in the right place at the right time. You know, you got lucky with some people. You know, going out of the country, mm -hmm. leaving you some gear. Uh, yeah. What was the hardest part? Do you think? Well, I mean, I think it's a, the hardest part that continues. It never goes away uh, as being a creative artist in this industry is like you got to make specific choices. And a lot of those choices uh, end up meaning that you're broke for a lot of the time, like you don't have money. Right. Because in order to be able to be creatively free, sometimes you can't take on every single corporate job that comes along your way. And as you uh, kind of rise up with all your peers and – bigger and better jobs come through some of them like jobs that I've been offered are just not in my headspace or my heart like where I'm like I don't want to creatively spend my time working on a project if I don't believe in it and if I don't creatively think that it'll be a really fun thing to work on and that other people will, will enjoy it the right. way I want so I have to work on things that I'm into basically is the long long part of that answer. Yeah. And uh, if I'm not into it, I'm not going to work on it. I know I wouldn't, and I wouldn't be doing anyone who I'm working with a favor by working on something that I'm not into just for cash or whatever. So I've, I've definitely, uh, you know, uh, not taken on jobs that would have been like way more financially uh, rewarding. But, you know, I mean, and I've also, you know, had uh, difficult times working with uh, a lot of different people because uh, we'll creatively clash over stuff. Or they're just a bunch of jerks. It's one of the two. I'm never wrong. So, <laughs> you know, I've, I've, I've had the uh, opportunity to work with a bunch of fucking assholes. Just kidding. No, I've had the opportunity to work with a lot of amazing creative people. But with uh, working with uh, other creative people, you know, personalities will clash. So, 
yeah, that's what happens. It's it's always got to be about the right fit. Now you you know you it's kind of the old adage, you know, do what you love, and the success and money will kind of find uh, find its way to you. You're obviously doing what you love, you know, Metalocalypse and and Venture Bros, which is which is cool. But I think it's only really in the last ten years that you know Adult Swim and this whole genre and this culture of adult oriented animation has really come to fruition. It's really kind of taking on a you know, a feel of its own. Why do you think it's now that this is happening? Do you think it's really just the kids from the 70s and 80s are growing up and we just love that style? Or is it something else? I think I mean? so. I, th I think that's a good a good way of looking at it. I also think that uh, as our world expands and contracts the same at the same time with the internet, and, you know, now we're just literally a click away from seeing what other people are watching on, in a, on the other side of the planet, um, I think uh, everyone's uh, tastes are expanding. And I mean, just look at Netflix. I mean, you've got uh, families in the middle of uh, Wisconsin watching, uh, you know, Miyazaki film or uh, seeing a Jodorowsky film or seeing, you know, I mean, seeing some truly experimental or surreal or foreign films that they would never rent. Totally. Ever. Yeah. And now they just say, hey, I'll check this out. They just click on something and watch it. And I just think it's expanding people's tastes and, and broadening everyone's horizons creatively. So I'm really excited about all, the, all of that. I think, uh, you know, basically working, working on grim fairy tales uh, for me is like an, an expansion of the work I've been doing on Adult Swim. Because Adult Swim, when you really look at it, is, is basically all of the – everything they have on Adult Swim has to be a comedy. Right. Whether it's a super weird comedy or a cartoon comedy or a live action comedy, it's all based on – you know, comedy, yeah. bizarre comedy, but still comedy and grim fairy tales. I wanted to do an adult take. Let's talk yeah. about let's talk about that. Uh, you know, briefly, uh, briefly, because I wanted to touch on grim fairy tales, which is based on isn't it like the longest running independent color comic of all time or something? Yeah, it is. It's a comic company uh, based out of uh, Philly slash Pennsylvania. It's like uh, it's uh, Zenoscope Entertainment. And uh, I met those guys through a good friend of mine, Ben Jackadoff. He introduced me to them at Comic-Con like uh, two years ago. And I was looking to expand and get out into doing other kinds of animation. I was writing an anthology of my own at the time. And I met those guys, Joe and Ralph, who run Zenoscope. And uh, they gave me a bunch of their trade paperbacks. And, you know, honestly, it's like a, if you're familiar with the comic book and you just see the covers, it looks just like, you know, a, a, a comic book version of Maxim where it's just a bunch of, uh, you know, well-endowed ladies running around in skimpy superhero outfits and you know it's like cheesecake so for being a comic book uh person myself who you know it's very much like a, a reader of like things like alan moore or frank miller or uh you know warren ellis or azarello uh you know i mean i really seriously never looked at those comics before and kind of like you know oh that's a cute cover you know girl's pretty hot in comic yeah, book yeah version. exactly so it's kind of like you know, it was a joke to me so uh, when I finally, uh, you know, picked up those copies through Zenoscope giving them to me, and they're like, yeah, just read them. And I actually read them, and they were really fun to read. So, uh, once again, I judged a book by its cover, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, so, interesting um, how that came back full circle. Yeah, I mean, you know, you always learn, you know. Like, you, you get lessons taught to you just like you teach other people. So, uh and I was like, you know what? I'm going to support this, and uh, I'm going to I'm going to try to turn this into an animated series. You know, and uh, by doing that, you know, I was able to uh, add a lot of things that I wanted to do as a director and as a writer. You know, they gave me total freedom to write the uh, write the pilot the way I wanted to. So I took like Joan Ralph's original comic book script and kind of like flipped it a little bit even more on its head because they had flipped all the grim fairy tales on their head. Like if you ever check out the grim fairy tales through Zenoscope uh, Entertainment, they have a ton of trades and you know, I highly suggest picking up the first like six trade paperbacks and just just read all of them because they're great interpretations of all your classic uh, fairy tales. And I really I really liked it. It's definitely like Tales from the Crypt style yeah. grim fairy tales. So for me, that was really fun. And it's a uh, you know I don't know if we're, we haven't sold the series yet, so we're going to release it. Uh, I just posted the first like four minutes of the actual uh, Grim Fairy Tales on YouTube. Yeah, so you can... and it looks great. I mean, I honestly checked it just before uh, we started this interview, and I think it oh, looks right like it's super high quality stuff, man. I mean, when people Thanks. when people have campaigns on Kickstarter, there's always this fear that there's going to be a little bit of amateur hour and stuff like that. Yep. But uh, this is some, you know, this is something that could go on, you know, Adult Swim or or any other kind of channel, you know, less the comedy element. This is broadcast quality stuff. 
Right, it's broadcast yeah. quality, but it's not for Adult Swim, so it won't, it'll, it'll never play on Adult Swim. Exactly. So I didn't make it to sell it to Adult Swim. I mean, I made it to actually like try to restart an adult market for animation here in America because as our, like I said, as our horizons broaden, I think Americans are ready for this kind of animation. It's not, it's not family guy. It's not like poo on a stick. It's, it's adult situations with crazy horror filled endings. And I think it, you know, it, there's something, there's something there to be made. And I think a lot of people are going to enjoy seeing it. So I say, get it out there and let people, uh, let the viewers decide, you know, if there's an, if there's millions, production company will want to pick it up and make it into a series so yeah and uh, this is something that you took to kickstarter last year about this time you got funded what was your whole experience with like uh crowdsourcing i guess in general because you know the big thing in headlines in the last i guess two three days has been veronica mars now you know a fan favorite cult series that ran for three seasons i think on upn and cw uh, now has yeah. a film. Now they have a film, and you know you funded this last year. Your Superman doc got funded this year. Tell you know, let's just talk about crowdsourcing. Yep. Is is it legit? Do you like? What do you think about it? I think crowdsourcing is the way to go. I mean, I had a, a great experience doing the Grim Fairy Tales. I ran that campaign. I mean, my my name isn't at, on there as like you know creator of the campaign because Zenoscope set up the account. Right. But I basically ran it. Um, I did all the video interviews. I I you know did it every every week. Uh, we put at least one or two videos up, and we we came up with ways to get the people excited. So, I it was a very it was a very great learning experience for me, and um, I'm very happy that we were able to raise the money to make the actual series the way that I wanted to be able to make it because you actually it costs animation costs money, and a lot of people think, oh, John's director of uh, Metalocalypse, he's got a ton of money, and I don't. You know, I'm paid you know probably a little bit more than the average citizen, so. Uh, you know, and that's not a lot of money. So, right. and it goes, and I have to pay rent and bills and all that kind of stuff too. So, um, I don't have like an, some kind of yeah. I'm just gonna drop this seven million. You know, I just don't have that. I don't have any of that money. So, um, you know, a lot of people even complain like David Fincher. How come he didn't pay for the goon? It's like, look, you know, he's a director. So what if he has a million dollars? He's he's a director. He's gonna help make this film. That doesn't mean he has to personally put his money in. I bet he put a couple thousand in. Why can't a couple other people put ten dollars in? You yeah, know, exactly. I look at like Kickstarter is a great way to get your thing that you're into made because that's how I look at it. I don't. I'm happy that Veronica Mars got. Three, four. I don't. I hope it makes ten million. Yeah. And I'm. I think I'm in the minority here because I've been reading a lot of articles uh, that people are putting out over this week about they're kind of bitter about you know Kickstarter. Totally. You know, the success of Veronica Mars are bitter about it. I don't think that's the right attitude. I think Not it's like, all. look, all the people who are into Veronica Mars now get to watch a movie. That would have never happened if it wasn't for Kickstarter. That doesn't. De- diminish the fact that I got to make and or that I'm making the death of Superman lives what happened because of Kickstarter a niche genre based documentary that about if I if I tried to get this funded it would never happen right it would have I would have been laughed out of like if I tried talking to the Warner Brothers DC people they'd be like nobody's interested in that thing it's 15 years old if I just went around to different production companies hey I'd like to do this documentary they would have just like said absolutely not so by actually running something on Kickstarter, you can try out and see who else is interested in it. I was shocked and surprised at how many more people were just as interested as I was in to find out more about this, uh, this stranger version of Superman. And not, when I say strange, I actually mean more creative and fun and exciting. That would have been a cosmic science fiction film like, yeah. done by Tim Burton. So it would have had a lot of fun. It would have had a lot of flair. It would have... It would have pushed the character into different areas that that character never went, and especially the ones that we all wanted him to to go into, which would be like fighting an alien. You know, it's like exactly. Well, you, you hit on something really interesting, John, and I've I've run an Indiegogo campaign, which is for everybody listening, something similar to Kickstarter. It's a mm-hmm. crowdfunding uh, site. There's a few differences with you know you know it, with your deadlines and how how much money you get to keep from everything that's raised. 
But it's really, a. I think the big thing that you hit on is, you know, it's a big marketing thing. It's not only just trying to get money. It's to see who's responding to the material that's out there and what kind of feedback you're getting from them. That should tell you right away if what you're trying to pursue is, is worth kind of pursuing to the next step. If you're not getting your funding, especially on an all or nothing site like Kickstarter, maybe there's something wrong with your concept. I mean, I talk to a lot of filmmakers that think, okay, I can just put something up on Kickstarter and I'll be making my film next month. Well, it's kind of a little bit harder than that. And now that you've gone through two campaigns, I mean, you realize that Kickstarter uh, and crowdfunding in general isn't just, you know, put it on, sit back, put your feet up and watch the money roll in. It takes a lot of work to make it a success. Yeah, it's a it's like a full time job, to be honest with you, like the, the doing the first Kickstarter for Grim Fair figure out how are we going to get this how are we going to get the next increase in money how are we going to get more fans how are we going to get more eyeballs how are we going to get more people aware of this so that was a big battle last year and we won so this year when i was like i you know i i'm a big fan of getting other people who are like-minded who want to see what i want to make to make it you know yeah so having done the first one and then successfully now doing the superman one you know right now i'm like in the midst of like writing out all of the the documentary elements for the Superman Lives uh, documentary, getting like next month I'll be calling out and getting all the interviews and, uh, but uh, honestly I'm super excited. Like I, even before this Superman documentary, I was ready to launch another Kickstarter, an animated series. I even have the sizzle reel done. Everything's ready. And then this uh, Superman idea just kind of like took over my mind. I was like man, I think it would be be fun to take a break from doing animation or even doing a live action feature, which is another thing I want to do. Right. And just do a documentary about this thing that I'm into and just see like if other people are into it. So that's why I wanted to give it a shot, you know? Yeah. And that, it's a, that it was a big success is really fun for me. I'll be able to make it now. And, uh, and then I'm going to move on and do another animated series and I'm going to do a feature film on Kickstarter. And I'm, I think that it's the way to go. And it's, I feel personally great when I can deliver amazing things like the when people who put money into Grim Fairy Tales, the response I'm getting from even just showing the first three minutes is just like, wow, thank you. Because it's like a lot of people, you're right, think you're going to just chimp off and be like, thanks for that money, son. Bam. You know, just go waste it. And here's like a five second thing, you know, or whatever. It's like, no, nah, I didn't for that for that Grim Fairy Tales. I didn't even take one dollar to pay my rent or bills or anything for the nine months. So you do have to actually build in some kind of – if you're going to work on something full-time, you have to build in like some kind of support mechanism for yourself. You know? So right. that's what I've done so I can make other things. I'm like, all right, well, I have, you know, I'm, I have other jobs that I'm doing now, so, and I also have a support mechanism to help me get to all these next things I want to do. So. so let's talk about the Superman Lives doc for a moment. We've been kind of dancing around it and coming back to it in every section of this interview so far. Uh, you know, the, the death of Superman Lives, what happened to Superman Lives? I mean, your, your intro video on, on Kickstarter tells the viewer exactly about your passion for the project. And you have like a connection to it. And I think that's, you know, part of the reason it sold so well, because people can see how, you know, jazzed you are about it. But, you know, tell us a little bit about the doc itself. You know, what's the structure? Is it going to be like a voiceover driven? I know you want to do a lot of interviews. Uh, like, like, what's your vision for this documentary on this production that never came to fruition? Well, I've been formulating it over the last couple of months and it's going to be it's going to be a lot of fun to basically put together, so to speak. Okay. So yeah, the the way I want to open up the film is basically uh doing kind of a reenactment with Siegel and Schuster and like what they were talking about with their idea of Superman when they created him and uh basically it'll start out with uh you'll see a bunch of images around their office, wrestlers, circus performers. So I want to just kind of like get the audience even if they're have never heard of you know the creation of superman or what a superhero is i want to get them on page one as to like what launched superheroes why batman looks almost the same as superman it's basically like why some why these characters all wore their underwear on the outside it was just basically like what it looked like back then i mean uh, then cut to everybody else like wearing suits and fedoras and, and ties um and sort of uh, from that point, all of a sudden take a, a very visual journey through the 40s and 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, right up to the 90s, right up to uh, through the, 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 the character Superman and his history. You also see all these other superheroes and their characters all being born and what's going on and going through all the, all the different decades. And then when we get to the 90s, like right around where Superman was about to get uh, 
uh, Kevin Smith was writing it and John Peters is, you know, Superman lives, gets announced. Then we like instantly stop and then we jump forward into the future, which is 2013. And now we start talking about like what happened. So then we sort of take an archaeological aspect to it where start talking to the production designers, talking to all the people involved, talking to the screenplay writers, Kevin Smith, Wesley Strick, talking to the producer, John Peters, talking to Tim Burton, talking to Nicolas Cage. I mean, I'm, I'm going to try to get every single person who was involved in this production to talk to me about it. And, and honestly, it's like, you know what's the best thing about this doing this for me is since I've had this kind of really fun fascination with it, like doing this documentary has just opened up the floodgates. A lot of people, a lot of artists have just been emailing me their art, the people who actually worked on, worked on Superman Lives. That's a awesome. lot of designers, I mean, and things that I haven't seen in the 15 years like that I've like, you know, every once in a while I'll just click online and like, ah, Superman Lives, concept art, what else is up there? Oh, wow, that weird Lex Luthor satellite. That's cool. That, you know, different things. But I just, this weekend, got like some like crazy insane like full color production design artwork that just was like oh my god you don't even believe you wouldn't understand how close to making this film that they were it was i mean it's like down to like oh that's the set for all of these shots that I've, that coincide with what wesley strict script here's all the i mean it's just really right down to like the the you know and three two one and oh wait don't fire that gun <laughs> you know <laughs> it's pretty amazing. So I'm really excited to do that. I mean, with the documentary, I didn't actually raise all the money for the stretch goals that I wanted to. So I'm not, I'm not going to be able to do everything that I wanted to, but I'm going to be able to do a bunch of scenarios and scenes. I'm going to be able to do some animatics. I will be able to do a couple of live action scenes. And, uh, you know, and also a lot of people have still uh, been contributing and wanting to contribute. So uh, even though I raised 115 on Kickstarter, I do believe my uh, my budget will be going up uh, through either private investors or just more fans who want to you know buy into some of the bigger packages. Who are like, I only found out about this documentary like after it ended. Right. So, I mean, for me, that was part of my uh, reasoning for doing the 45 day because uh, a lot of Kickstarters are 30 days. Yeah. Um, but I was like, I don't know. I don't even know if people are going to understand what I'm trying to do, like uh, to try to get the word out to as many uh, uh, fans of superheroes and comic books, as well as just people interested in film and the, the whole idea and notion of like films that almost were. So it took a while for me to like figure out how I was going to do it online. And then once it launched that, like I got press like over the first week of that Superman Kickstarter, I was like interviewed by like hundreds of websites and it just went all over the place. So it was, it was really fun. And then the feedback I got from, uh, from just normal people who were interacting with me on Kickstarter were like, Hey, I'm so glad you're doing this. I've always had the same feelings about this Superman lives thing. I always wanted to know why it didn't happen. A lot of other people were emailing, like I've thought about trying to make a documentary, but I just never thought I could and this and that. So I'm really glad you're doing it. So it was really cool to see and, 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 and get that kind of reaction from people. So. so without getting too deep, for people that are listening, you know, what's your take on the Superman Lives kind of story or plot? And the, the, the second part of that question is why do you think it got kind of shut down? You know, just to, just to entice people to really still kind of get behind this project. Because, you know, I'm sold. The second you said you wanted to make a doc on this film, because I, I remember, like, it's production stuff. And, of course, being a huge Kevin Smith fan during the 90s, I, I was hooked the second I saw it on Kickstarter. Right. But for everybody out there that doesn't know, like, how would you describe the story and, how, and why it's a radically different kind of take on Superman? Um, uh, just go for it. Well, here's the thing. I mean... I don't think it's a radically different take on Superman. I think the radical overreaction of fans on the internet is what killed Superman. I think, you know, I mean, above and beyond uh, trepidation from all of the people who were involved in this project back in 97 and 98, simply because Batman and Robin was such a giant bomb, not only financially, but just critically and reaction wise, everyone was. You know, yeah. I mean, here's the thing. A lot of kids who were born in like 1991, they grew up loving Batman and Robin. They're like, that was my favorite thing with Mr. Freeze. It's like, <laughs> I get it. That's because you were five. Yeah. Your brain didn't even work yet. So, you know, <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that you liked it. I'm not going to, you know, take it out on you. A lot of people like Jar Jar Binks, too, because they were seven. You know, they grew up, you know what I'm saying? They're like yeah. young, young, young kids who just didn't understand. You know, it's like it's not like they're supposed to know whether this film is a horrible mess or not. Yeah. Um, 
But, you know, adults who uh, reacted the way they did to, you know, to the Superman, Nicolas Cage casting and, and Tim Burton being the director of Superman, I think silly. I mean, it's really like a, a giant overreaction comparatively to like when Batman and, and Tim Burton was doing Batman. If, if people reacted to Michael Keaton being cast as Batman, if we had yeah. the Internet that existed in 98 that didn't exist that way in 88 – Right. I don't think Batman would have happened. So, you know, because I think producers would have felt like, oh my God, our fans are, are you know, are turning against us. And honestly, the people who comment online, you know, there's a small minority, you know, people yeah. who actually spend time to type out a sentence onto a, onto a, a comment board, you know, it's like their, their opinions are important, but they shouldn't sway. Uh, studios. That's what I feel. I mean, I think it's like if a studio is in production and they feel confident with what they're doing, then ultimately whatever the end result is going to be is what is going to be. It shouldn't be it shouldn't be swayed one way or the other by some one person's opinion online. Yeah, so totally agree. Uh, so, I mean, I guess the question that I really want to ask you then Superman Lives gets kind of canceled. It's, you know, shelved indefinitely. We're left with, you know, bits of art that comes out, you know, through the years since. But in 2006, we got Superman Returns. Oh, dude, yeah. Well, I was going to say this. I mean, I'm not saying that all fans who comment on things are wrong. I'm definitely not saying that because – and that studio heads shouldn't listen because what we got with Fantastic Four, Rise of the Silver Surfer, Galactus as a Cloud is yep. embarrassing. Yep. It's a simple – like embarrassing. Number one, they're going the wrong way with Fantastic Four, making it a goofy comedy. Yep. Number two, they just – the people who are making it just did not understand what Stanley and Jack Kirby were trying to do with Fantastic Four. Henceforth, they didn't understand Fantastic Four. Henceforth, anyone who likes Fantastic Four is going to hate on that movie. Yeah. So you just like all you're doing is releasing a giant pile of shit for all of us to hate. So, I mean, th that's what I say. Like when people are like react to like Galactus is a cloud and everyone is like, what's up with that? And then the studio heads are like, well, relax, relax. We're going to have a shadow of Galactus's helmet on the moon. And that's what the, the fanboys are then going to really like suck our cocks for that because <laughs> they're going to be really happy that we gave them that little bonus because we know what we're doing and they're going to listen to us and it's our movie's going to be a giant hit. So it's like, it's sort of this, uh, uh, this attitude that has to be uh, both uh, acknowledgement and understanding and also confidence. Like, I know what I'm doing. I'm honoring the whole reason we're making these comic books into movies. I'm into it. Like, eventually, I'll be making comic book movies as a narrative. I'm going to be doing that. That's my goal in life. Very cool. I'm, I'm into science fiction. I'm into fantasy. I'm into comic books. That's what I'm going to I'm going to do that. So I'm fully, I'm fully aware of all the mistakes that have happened with a ton of these superhero films and the ones that have actually been successful and, and done a great job at reinterpreting characters like uh, Christopher Nolan's The Dark Knight, The Joker, an incredible reinterpretation of that character, super successful. You know? Yeah, totally. It doesn't, it doesn't take away from the Joker that existed before. It gives you a brand new reinterpretation. So um, uh, to get back to, uh, to Superman... I think, uh, you know, make, making the, the case for Superman as to why I think it would have been a really fun film, uh, it's, it's a reading Wesley Strick's script. It's, it's, it's a really fun adventure. A lot of people also have to remember that a first draft is exactly that, a first draft. In the world of television and movies, uh, things change from a script that is a first draft to what you're actually seeing in the theater or on television. They change radically most of the time. Uh, lines are re rewritten. Uh, entire sequences are cut out and re redone. Entire beginnings, middles, and ends are cut out and rewritten completely. Storylines are changed. Actors come in, bring their own interpretation to it. I mean, there's so much that happens just even before you start shooting that then you're shooting, if you're live action and you're shooting, a whole bunch of things change. Yeah. Uh, the, then you get into the editing process, post sound effects, and cutting things around, changing changing rhythms and dynamics. Everything about that is something that creates what it is the end product that we see. So I think it's it's impossible to uh, critique uh, a script from its first draft and just say it's trash or it's shit. You know, it's like it's like yeah, certain things might might not ring right when you read it, or certain sequences seem weird. But you know, for for what. Uh, for what Tim Burton was trying to do, I think that the Superman movie that he was going to make was going to be quite a lot of fun. 
and a really, uh, a, like I said, like a cosmic sci-fi adventure, you know? Yeah, which is what I think everybody's been waiting for, for Silver or Superman on the silver screen, right? Like a cosmic kind of combatant that actually well, gives him a chance, you know? So, like you mentioned, Superman Returns. Like, so, uh, you know, Superman Lives didn't happen. And then they had J.J. Abrams and McGee's Superman, which yep. uh, I, I got a chance to see some of the screen tests and some of the animatics for that, which looked great. It was basically would have been one of the most exciting Superman movies ever made. A ton of action sequences. Yeah, great script. Uh, yeah, but I'm, I'm just saying even the animatics that McG McG was quite a, a long way into making this film, you know, when he didn't stop making it. So uh, when Brian Singer took over uh, with Superman Returns, his whole pitch was to bring it back to Richard Donner's take on Superman, to bring it back to like what happened right after Superman 2 and disregard Superman 3 and 4 because those were jokey comedic waste of time but let's bring it back to you know the first two movies which hey look you know what i mean they were really great but they were, they were also really jokey even without richard lester just the donner cut like superman flying around the earth to spin time backwards yeah there was a you know there was a lot of elements in there that or you know were strange and weird i love superman too that was the movie for me when i was a kid you know mm -hmm. um but uh the funny thing about, you know, even fans sometimes, everyone was complaining, well, as long as it's not Zod, come on, we've already had Zod. And it's like, to me, I'm like, yeah, we had Zod in 1980. Yeah. Isn't it about time, like 27 years later, to have Zod come back in a movie? I don't know. I, but yeah, Superman has a lot of different villains. Brainiac, it would be great to see a couple of different villains instead of the same Lex Luthor, Lex Luthor. So Superman Returns, to me, was was quite a disappointment, especially with the the promises that were made with Superman lives and even Superman flyby like, Oh, it's going to be a new Superman. It's going to be this adventure. Even with JJ Abrams, like Krypton doesn't blow up. There's a war on Krypton, just something different, please. Yeah, you know, exactly. And then you get super Superman returns. What do you get? You get Lex Luthor wanting to buy land property again. I mean, it just like kind of absurd stupidity with the script, just on, in general, just a really boring and horrible script. So, I mean, and then the execution of it, though, it, it's beautiful to look at. Like, the cinematography is really great. They definitely spent money. Um, it just falls flat. I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's kind of a boring blockbuster when you really put – I fell asleep in the theater twice. I hate to admit it, but, like, I actually – my girlfriend had to nudge me because I was sleeping. Wow. Because, I mean, I, I, and when you fall asleep at a superhero action movie, there's something wrong. And yeah. Especially if you're a fan. So I talked to a lot of other superhero fans who uh, – same thing with Phantom Menace. They just didn't want to admit that it sucked. You know, yeah. so they're like, no, 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 it was good. It was good. The, the, the plane sequence, that was the best part. Or like, you know, certain things about Brandon Routh. It's like, look, you know what? I'm not going to nitpick every single element. Brandon Routh was great as Superman, you know, but just the overall movie just felt like I was watching something from the 70s, but just not done as well. You know, it's just like totally agree. The, the element of Superman fighting anything was like not there. It was just him lifting a bunch of random items over the course of two and a half hours. And then including lifting a giant mountain made of kryptonite, which is just silly. It's like, here, let's establish these rules and then break them at the last minute. It's like it's like everything you could possibly do wrong in that in, in the, the realm of storytelling and filmmaking is that film. You know? <laughs> I could break it apart even more so because I've done it before to people who tried to defend Superman Returns. I'll destroy it if I want, you know, if they wanted me to and they cannot defend it. It's like, hey, look, if you, you can still argue and say it's a great film, but here's all the reasons I think it's not and will never be a good film. So and Brian Singer's even Brian Singer's gone on the record to admit it. Like last year, he was hanging out with a friend and he was like, hey, uh, I pop Superman Returns into the DVD player and I have to admit it just was kind of boring. He said it, you know. Wow. So it's it's sort of like it's not like he's a bad filmmaker. I'm excited to see his X Men return. So it's sort of like, you know, he's done a lot of good films. He's also done some bad films. We all have our hits and misses, me included. I'm like I'm a a low level television guy, and I've I've done some pretty horrible films. So it's like, but you know, it's you know. Uh, it's it's interesting you're doing a doc on Superman Lives because if Superman Returns hadn't got made. I can see that this that story would have been something that would have warranted, you know, maybe a documentary on its own. Like, who wouldn't want to explore that concept of, you know, Superman going away after his fight with uh, Zod and everything, and you know where he had been. You know, I right. think, you know, I, I think you could apply it either way. And I like to think of all these different superhero, you know, flicks throughout the ages as just different kind of runs of comics. You know, 
it, it, it's, it shouldn't be like a, a yes or no, a black or white kind of decision. I know there's a, like millions of dollars on the lines for studios and they're trying to launch franchises so they can get new trilogies out there and make a fortune. And it's going to be right. another decade before we get any kind of new you know incarnation of these characters. But I'm all for just you know having one-offs of this style of Superman, this style of Batman or Spider-Man, because then you're not so tied to things. But I'm probably in the minority that I like to see more exploration than you know well, a, you get- a cookie cutter. You get to see that in animation because the animated films that Warner Brothers does are awesome. a lot lower. They're, they're a lot lower budget, so they can afford to take more chances. Like I was really happy with the Dark Knight parts one and two. Awesome! What they a were great awesome. adaptation! Kudos to those guys for making such an amazing adaptation to a, a, an incredible comic that helped change my life. It's like as a as a teenager, I read Dark Knight and it just flipped my lid. So. To see it now done such a, as such an amazing cartoon with love and care and also great nuances and come to life as a real cartoon. I mean, that's that's the kind of thing that I'm proud of with Warner Brothers and DC. You know, it's like, to me, like Superman Lives, the reason I even became more interested in it was because of Superman Returns. Because Superman Returns was such a disappointment, right. I started to be like, well, what happened to that really cool, crazy Superman where it was like, it was like Nicolas Cage was going to be Superman? That would have been at least exciting and weird and interesting. So that, that got me really going. And then Kevin Smith had his whole take on, on what his experiences were with John Peters, which were really funny, but it was like, Hey, that, that's at least that's something different, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, it, as more artwork started to get released in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, just more people were just seeing more stuff on the internet, just like me. And uh, I was like, I think it would be worthy of an exploration as a documentary and also a way to look at uh, the character and the whole idea of what a superhero is in the idea of making it from a comic book into a movie. Yeah. So you have to look at all the productions of Superman when you look at Superman Lives because trace elements of every single Superman, even Superman Returns, that had the death of Superman. There's a little moment in Superman Returns where he's all sick and dying and he's in the hospital. These elements carried through. I mean, there's so many elements that are just like – and you understand it because it's a business and Warner Brothers spent money on this property. They're like, look, we did all this R&D on this certain section of Krypton. Can we bring that in and uh, you know, certain elements of this – you know, design work looks great and will work great in this film and then carry that over into the next film. If it doesn't, doesn't happen, it's, I, it totally makes sense to me because it's, it is one character and you're trying to make this character's reboot connect with the audience, the audience that's around every decade. So the Superman returns did not connect with the people of 2006. So the people of 2013 are going to connect with a brand new Superman. I think Man of Steel is going to be incredible. I'm very excited about that. I've got really mixed results, probably because of Superman Returns. I'm not going to get excited for it. I've already determined. And right now, because there are so many superhero flicks, I I don't get excited about them anymore. Before, it was like, oh my God, there's a a fucking Spider-Man movie. Oh my God, it's like Batman Begins. But now it's like Batman, Iron Man, Thor, Avengers. Fuck, it's like every two months there's a new superhero film. Right. Just getting a little oversaturated. Not that I'm not, you know, interested in these heroes anymore but i take it for granted now that there's going to be a new cape sure. crusader on the screen in fucking two months time for the rest of the summer yeah, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I, I mean i really don't know what else to say it's just the way it is now every six weeks there's a new costume guy on the screen yeah whether it's you know a, one of the big two uh property by them or you know a smaller studio so well with that being said I was going to say, with that being said, I, w- I really, truly wish Warner Brothers would not wait until Man of Steel comes out to launch their Justice League. I think they should just, they should just be like, look, this is the new Superman. We believe in this. We're going to wrap him around, and he's going to be the thing that carries into the Justice League. Because the Justice League has all these other super-powered characters. It has Wonder Woman. It has Green Lantern. It has Flash. It has the Martian Manhunter if they decided to use him. Yeah. I mean, the only other person in Justice League that's normal or human is Batman. Yeah. So, you know, I don't know. It's, obviously, it's their, it's their company. They're a multi-billion dollar company. That's just my, my tiny opinion. So, <laughs> that, Well, everybody's entitled. Hope Maybe they're listening and... Uh... They'll, they'll you know start making some decisions regarding that John I'm gonna I'm gonna say thanks for your time uh, we always wrap up our interviews on the trenches here with uh, three kind of fanboy like questions so sure. if you'll, you'll indulge me with something that you can have hundred percent fun with that'd be great yes sir uh, question one since we're talking about superheroes you can be any superhero or have their powers how would you use their powers to kind of help your uh, your careers in film and television let's see if I could have any superpower 
Well, or, or like any hero that has, you know, kind of a combination of powers. So, I mean, you could say Superman if you wanted and get all those, you know, that bundle. Um, yeah, since I'm talking about Superman and doing the documentary, I will pick him because then I would be able to build sets incredibly fast. And, uh, you know, and you know, hey, I, hey, I went out into Brazil and like chopped all these trees and replanted them in about 15 seconds and then brought all this, uh, you know, right. that would be pretty incredible if you could build like, yeah, I'm building these giant, crazy uh, sci- science fiction sets. I built this entire spaceship in like 48 seconds as Superman. So that would be a pretty cool power. Okay. Uh, second- to be able to build things really quickly. <laughs> and then I would also use that not just for film and television, but I would build the homeless people a lot of homes. Just and th- like, here's a 400 foot tower of, of homeless shelters. But so. not necessarily in that order. You might do the homeless things first. Probably that would be done first. Okay. Since we're, since we're being so altruistic about it all. So that's <laughs> question number one. Good. Question number two uh, you can have an action figure of yourself. What kind of special action does your figure have, and what accessories do you come with? Uh, I come with a Banshee Gibbon style screaming power. Okay. Where, which would be like a, a button at the back of the neck that you could depress and he would just, ah, 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 like super loud. <laughs> okay. Um, and so. accessories? Accessories, uh, the Watchmen hardcover comic book, um, Miracle Man, all the issues of Miracle Man as like little tiny, almost like Jack in the Box, like comics. Okay. Um, and, uh, you know, Jack, uh, Jack Kirby's Devil Dinosaur and Machine Man. Um, comic books as well it sounds like a deluxe figure i like it yeah. add, add an extra six dollars that's, that's the variant issue and, uh, <laughs> it's the chase release of john yeah. schnepp i like it uh the third question for you uh you can uh build a time machine out of anything what would it be and where would you go once it was built i'll, I'll answer that with two answers one that the evil version of myself <laughs> would get as many weapons as possible and go back into medieval times and take over a kingdom just okay. like have like four or five tanks and a bunch of uh, semi-automatics and be like, kneel before Zod. So that would be the evil version of myself uh, using time travel to become the emperor of the known universe. Uh, the good version of myself would use uh, time travel to time travel back maybe like 10 or 15 years and buy all the fucking awesome comics that I didn't buy that are worth a lot of money. Right. Uh, make some bets on uh you know, sports games I don't even watch just to become a millionaire and then give all that money away to charities and things so that when I come back to where I am now in 2013, I would be able to see all this cool stuff that happened just simply by being able to play the odds that by, by knowing the answers to certain things, you could affect the future by hundreds and hundreds of percentages as opposed to like one or two percent, be like thousand fold percentages like, hey, you know, poverty doesn't even exist anymore because of these 26 steps from going back in time, stopping the stock market uh, crash that was all negotiated by a bunch of rich people. It's like, hey, just don't let them do it. And then all the suffering from the stock market, all the poverty from the stock market, it was all it was, all it was, was just businessmen making some decisions like, hey, we'll put these guys out of business and then we'll take over. And then just America just suffered for it. So if I had the power to go back and change time like that, then I would. So. And if you could make your time machine out of anything, what would you make it out of? Like, would you go Bill and Ted style phone booth, Back to the Future, a car? Uh, I would make it probably some kind of, uh, I guess, be my office because my office has a lot of really cool stuff in it. So it would just be like the TARDIS, you know? Right. You just step in and it just takes you wherever. Yeah. Cool. So that way, you know, if I was, if I was, I don't know how long time travel would take, but I'd have a lot of cool reading material. So. Oh, I like it. So, John, again, thanks for taking the time to be on the trenches. Uh, we covered a lot of great ground. I know a lot of people are going to love this episode. Um, so, thank you so much for hey, participating. Thanks for having me. No problem. Appreciate it. You've been listening to The Trenches. Of course, this is our ongoing series of interviews with filmmakers from around the world. Our guest, once again, was Mr. John Schnepp. More info about him on his website, which we'll post, of course, on our site, and you can link to it. Uh, Again, I'm your host, Rob McCallum. This has been The Trenches on the Wired In Network. (laughs) 